good morning, everyone. On behalf of the North Base PD Committee, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Julie Hayden. Julie is uh, a Master's of Social Work, uh, a registered social worker. She is the founder of Dialectical Living, uh, which provides group and individual uh, therapy uh, for uh, individuals who are seeking DBT here in the city. Um, and I know from personal experience that she is a very engaging uh, and a clear presenter and uh, she's going to give us a great overview of DBT today. It's difficult given the range of levels of experience that we have in our department from people who are very experienced to people who are completely new to DBT. So we've asked based on the survey data Julie to pitch it kind of at a beginner intermediate level. So if you're more of a pro please look at it as an opportunity to kind of refresh and see how somebody very skilled presents the information that you know and maybe help out some of your colleagues in the exercises that we'll be doing uh, because it is going to be an interactive workshop. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Julie Hayden. I'm so happy to be here today. There's nowhere else I would rather be right now. So let's start. Um, for those of you who may have seen the car, I think there was someone that I cut off in the parking lot, and I was very concerned. <laughs> so I'm sorry if that was one of you. <laughs> so you all know my car saying DBT skills. You'll recognize me now out in the streets, a little wave. Do you know how many people I've had stop me and run to my window and scare me at a red light and say, what is the, your license plate stand for. Mm -hmm. I've had people running out of stores. It, it's amazing. The different things people think it stands for. Not everyone knows DVD skills. So we have a lot of content. And I have a next slide about how we're going to look at this content. Um, I did my best to try and thin it out. I want you to keep in mind that the skills I'm showing you today take 12 weeks and 24 hours to teach. So to go through, to, to, to sort of weed things out was like quite the exercise. So I'm going to be going through, let's take a look at that slide first. So I'm going to be, um, yeah, 12 weeks and 24 hours. So I'm happy to provide a, a presentation. So I'm going to create PDFs. So a lot of the content I've left in here because I wanted you to have it in a PDF and I want you to know it's there. But we're gonna go through some slides really fast so that we get to the interactive exercises and I'm hoping at the end we get to a place where we're gonna talk about how can we bring DBT into, into our practice, into the school. So I'm hoping we get enough of a conversation there. There are a lot of interactive exercises, so it's possible we may have to sort of change things up uh, uh, you know, quickly and I'm really good at sort of adjusting things. So bear with me, there is a lot of content. So it's been created with you and your clients in mind. So the videos are all very usable for yourself as well as students. I've even found some videos, really cool ones sort of with kids uh, learning DBT and particularly the hand model, Dan Siegel's hand model. So I'm really happy to show you that. Um, going over content quickly. Oh, you'll notice these little clocks here. So these little clocks on the slides remind me to keep, tr keep track of time and remind me that the video that is uh, the link on the slide we will not be seeing. However, it's left there so that later on you'll be able to click on that link and watch it. Does that make sense for everybody? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. So we're going to do an opening mindfulness. DBT always has an opening mindfulness and a closing mindfulness. So we are going to do an opening one. You have a handout in front of you. So what I'd like you to do is write down three things. And we're going to start off in a positive note. Write three things down that have gone well. I had this week. However, if it's been in the last two weeks or the last month, that's okay too. Three things that have gone well. Today and the last week and last month that you can think of. Three things. So when you're finished, I'd just like you to turn and share with your neighbor these three things that went well so that you can share this good joy of the things that have gone well for you so we all start off feeling good and full of gratitude. So just share with your neighbor the three things that you have, or if you want to share just one or two, that's okay too. So I did a bit of, uh, Nancy helped provide me with some information, a little bit about you guys so that... I got a sense of who you are and what you do, so I'm just going to quickly go through this and you can, you know, let me know, make sure that I'm on the, the right page. So, who you are, healthcare pre pre professionals in an academic setting, responsible for the well-being of students across the TCDSB, assessments, intervention, transfers, handovers, and using several different strategies in our work. So maybe ACT, 
EFT, some DBT. Does that sound about right? Mm -hmm. And what you do, I understand in elementary you do assessments, classroom observation, consultation, social and emotional intervention, file review and documentation, and CBT groups. And in high school, some of the similar things, assessments, suicide risk assessments, teacher consultations, file review, individual counseling and groups. Does that sound like you? Wow, that's a lot. You guys do a lot. So here are the challenges that I understand you have. So limited number of sessions we can offer for intervention. That must be super hard to only have so many sessions and have to see a student. Working with behavioral students with limited resources, working with parents who are not aligned with accepting our services. I understand this is a big one. It can be really problematic. Managing relationships with other players, vicarious trauma. I'm sure all of us are experiencing this and stress. And I'm happy that uh, one thing I like when I teach DBT is I want everyone to think about this for themselves first. So when I teach it to families, when I teach it to healthcare practitioners, I want you to know that this is for you first and for your students second. So when you learn these DBT skills, I want you to be thinking about how you can use them. Because the best way for us to teach these skills is to be using them yourself and to lead by example. So you first, students second. Make sense? Yes. Okay, good. And, and ethical quandaries. So this is interesting. These are the results of, thank you to the 15 people who, who uh, filled these out. So uh, what is our familiarity with DBT? So we have 40% uh, have done one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one DBT training. So we've got 20% uh, knows what the acronym stands for and that's about it. We've got, I have learned about DBT through formal studies, which is 26%. I've done one DBT training and we've got 40%, that's pretty good. I've done more than one DBT training, so we have 13% and, and we've trained others. We don't have any of those. So, uh, so that's the familiarity of the group, it provided there's a bit of a representative sample there. And how often do you use DBT in your practice? So we'll just go from the first, so never, 33% always or occasionally, it looks like sometimes is the biggest one there. So it looks like, you know, there's a bit of a difference in terms of, it, it looks actually quite equal there, you know, sort of between never, sometimes, occasionally, um, and uh, not always, but sometimes and often. So I wanna talk a little bit about how does emotion dysregulation affect your population? We specifically at Dialectical Living work with a lot of people with borderline personality disorder just because DBT was originally developed for BPD and so a lot of the clients we get have BPD or identify themselves with. And I don't like to use labels, so I usually say challenge is regulating emotions. That's usually what I say, um, talking about emotion dysregulation or having challenges regulating emotions. So Marsha Linehan, who developed DBT, and I have a slide showing you, she just came out with her memoir which is pretty cool. I ordered a copy, actually a few copies. So here's some of the things that your clients may, may have issues with. So biopsychosocial models, so biological, and I won't go through all of these, but you know, things like anxiety and heart racing, can't breathe, sleep issues, and then we've got the psychological, so your body image, obsession, shame, flashbacks possibly, and then social, so people pleasing, passive, um, aggressive, so all of these things coming together, and you can see in the middle that we have depression, which completely makes sense, and and some of the things when you sort of the biological with the psycho psychological, so you see eating issues, dissociation. So this is really good to sort of see what are all the areas that our clients might be having challenges around. There's a lot there, a lot. So here, emotion dysregulation, all the things that that one might struggle with and my cool animation. So, black and white thinking, so characterizes many with emotion dysregulation or challenges regulating emotions. So things are all good or all bad. I'm sure we have clients who think this way, right? I'm sure some of us think that way. I know I do sometimes. <clears throat> I'm either helpless or completely independent. So again, sort of the opposite sides. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the dialectic, uh, which I think sometimes isn't taught as much. I mean, it is dialectical behavior therapy, so we're gonna go through what that is. I'm either the victim or the aggressor. My feelings are either euphoric or gloomy. I'm feeling completely abandoned or completely secure. Love you or hate you. The book, I love you, I hate you, don't leave me. People know about that book? Yeah, that says it all. <coughs> either helping me or harming me. Again, those dialectics, those polar opposites. So 
if anyone wants to read about, my colleague has started reading this and she's giving me the Coles Note version and so far she said that there's, it's very sad. How DBT works. So what's going on in the brain? And this is the most interesting piece when I teach DBT that really enlightens people. And for those of you, I'm sure many of you know about this, maybe all of you. However, in teaching it, it's one of the biggest things that we teach our clients where it light bulb goes off and they realize, oh, this isn't my fault. The things are happening in my brain that make it difficult to control my emotions, to control my impulses. It's usually one of the best and first things that you can teach your clients so they can stop feeling as much shame and as much lack of control over what's happening in the brain and that there's a physiology there. And I think it's super important to just spend a little bit of time here. So we've got your prefrontal cortex and your amygdala. And we know that when there's lots of stress and lots of arousal that those two become disconnected and the emotion center of the brain, the amygdala, runs the show. Mm -hmm. So no filter, uh, you know, things, uh, acting out in anger, all kinds of things can happen here, self-harm, uh, substance use, all of these things happen to dampen down the amygdala and the emotion center in the brain, which all makes sense, right? Makes sense. So, I love this slide. So here we are, so we've got all these things that the prefrontal cortex, and um, you might not be able to see some of these things, so the things like reality, testing, what is true, what is real, um, inhibition of appropriate actions, uh, top-down guidance and attention. So here we are when hyper-stressed brains, so we have compulsive behaviors, emotional responses, and then loss of prefrontal regulation. So we know that DBT works using, or on the emotions. So in emotions regulation, the overactivity of the limbic system, the fight, flight, freeze, hide mode, a lot of clients explain that this is what it feels like. That they're in fight, flight all the time. And can you imagine how painful that could be to be in that place all the time, exhausting? Yeah, 24 seven exhausting. So lose the ability to put on the brakes. And there's lots of studies that I've read around that in terms of neurotransmitters and things. We won't go into there, but it's kind of a fascinating thing for me. And it changes the way the brain processes threats or stress. So we also know that there's a high threat perception for a lot of clients who experience emotion dysregulation. And so reducing that threat can have all kinds of positive impacts. So for those of you who like studies, the academics of this. So there is this study, particular study was pre and post MRIs. So the pre MRI, then there was 12 months, I believe in this case of DBT. And at the end, they actually could see increased gray matter between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. So this DBT thing isn't just about people subjectively saying, I feel better at the end. They can actually see greater connections in an MRI. So I think it's pretty important for those who might not be sold uh, that this hopefully is the seller. So, Gabor Maté, I'm sure many of you, I got to see him speak. I actually helped organize and sell tickets for him at the JCC some years ago. So, I was happy to, to meet him. So, we're going to just watch a short video. The prefrontal cortex, you've been hearing about the brain today, I'm sure. And the prefrontal cortex has nine very um, important functions. It regulates the body itself. The prefrontal cortex being the mammalian cortex, the one that's latest to develop uh, evolutionary speaking. And it really is what distinguishes us from other animals. It regulates the body. It regulates attuned communication with others. It is responsible for emotional balance. It all allows us response flexibility. So response flexibility means that if you say something to me that might upset me, then instead of reacting, by screaming back at you, I can actually say, oh, okay, what's happening for you that you said that to me, and do I really have to take it personally? And then I can respond rather than react. Providing insight, providing empathy, the modulation of fear, so that when something happens, then the fear circuits in the brain start taking over, something in the prefrontal cortex will override that fear circuit, saying, okay, calm down, you can actually handle this. Intuition and morality. Now, Dr. Rick Hansen will follow my talk, which I think is perfect, and he'll be able to tell you that all nine of these modalities, these nine functions of the prefrontal cortex, are actually supported by mindful awareness practice.
So there he's talking about the prefrontal cortex. I, mindfulness is a big component of DBT, so it makes sense that any studies that you find that are related to mindfulness are quite similar in terms of the, the positive outcomes. How many people have heard of the Dan Siegel hand model? Okay, good, we have some. Okay, good. So there's lots of you going to learn about this model today. It's one of the best ways to teach kids this particular thing we're talking about, which is the prefrontal cortex and the, the amygdala. So um, I'm going to just turn to uh, Dan Siegel and let him do the work. And the frontmost part of this frontal lobe here is demarcated by your last knuckles down your fingernails, and this is called the prefrontal cortex. Now you may have heard a lot about the prefrontal cortex because it's involved basically in something called integration. It integrates cortex, limbic area, you can see it sits on top of it, brainstem, body, and even the social world together. Now, when you do a practice, let's say like we have a wheel of awareness practice as a form of mindfulness meditation, or do any kind of mindfulness reflective practice, you are integrating the whole system. When you're not integrated, it can become chaotic and rigid. It's like flipping your lid. So instead of living with harmony within yourself and harmony and connection to others, you're literally becoming chaotic with an outburst or rigid and withdrawn. That's demonstrated by literally lifting up your fingers and showing how this prefrontal region is no longer linking the cortex, limbic area, brainstem, body, and the social world. It's become disintegrated. Now the amazing thing is there's a new set of studies called the connectome studies which show how the areas of the brain that are differentiated can then become connected. So it's connectome. And what research has shown from the Human Connectome Project is the best predictor of your well-being is how interconnected your connectome is. So anything you can do to understand your hand model of the brain and to bring an honoring of differences and a connection of these areas, you'll be promoting integration and you'll be giving yourself the gift that keeps on giving. And the amazing thing too is that integration is likely the source of well-being, not just in our bodies, including the head brain, but in our relationships with other people and even with nature around us. Creativity emerges from this integration. Collaboration emerges from integration. So the hand model of the brain reminds us to know the different parts, understand how they may be differentiating themselves if we're angry or getting upset, feeling sad, feeling lonely, making thoughts that emerge, and then opening ourselves to all of these and connecting them together. Whether you do this in the wheel of awareness practice or some other kind of reflective practice, having this brain of yours become more integrated is the pathway toward more well-being in your life, whether it's at work, at home, or in your communities. Integration creates well-being. Thanks for joining me. And goodbye. Does anyone know that Lady Gaga talked about DBT on Oprah? No. Yes, she did. And we're going to see a short clip because I just thought this is awesome. And I have actually had clients call and say, I saw Lady Gaga and I want this DBT. <laughs> so she has been very good for business. Dialectical behavioral therapy, cognitive therapy. DBT therapy, yes. DBT therapy, yes. yes. And also... It's come through something that I learned through DBT, which is called radical acceptance. I am sitting here with arguably the most powerful woman on the planet. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I have radically accepted that I will put my shame in a box all the way over there and make it very small. She actually talks about problem solving and several other DBT concepts, so we're just looking at radical acceptance. I love this one. This is my favorite thing to talk about, so don't let me go on too long. How is DBT different from CBT? I get this question a lot. So we know that CBT, by nature, cognition, requires that this part of the brain be in check. So it makes sense that as someone who's walking around with this part of the brain, that they would have a very difficult time to be able to 
regulate their emotions, a very difficult time. So, <coughs> so we know that as Dan Siegel's model, the, you know, the frontal cortex and the amygdala. So what happens in CBT is that it's really hard to think through a thought record, a hot thought, to think through all those things because you really require your, your thinking brain to be intact. So CBT can be super challenging for people who struggle with emotion dysregulation because, and I have lots of people come to me in tears saying, I did CBT, I feel so much shame, it didn't work for me. And I say, well, CBT is a great therapy. It, it really is, so I'm not putting it down at all. I'd say to people though, do DBT first because DBT is all about reducing intensity on emotions. And so if we can do that, then we're better able to get that thinking part of our brain so that we can do this DBT. So what are dialectics? So why is mine? So emotion regulation is a condition of getting pulled into extremes, you know, black and white thinking. So that's why dialectical behavior therapy was about how do we have two polar opposites sort of on the same plane? So that's the dialectic and that's why we call the treatment dialectical. So some of the things here, we have rational mind, emotion mind, and wise mind. This is very fundamental to DBT. A lot of the skills, the skills help us to get to wise mind. And then some of the skills require us to be in wise mind when we're, when we're using them. So some of the things we've got here, emotion mind reactive, wise mind effective, rational mind logical, emotion mind expressive, wise mind intuitive. So you get the idea, rational mind linear. So you can see that there's different things and what we usually do in group is we have people help fill this out. So we, we have people, okay, what does rational mind look like? What does emotion mind look like? So you can see a lot of these things here. This is a good, actually a really good exercise to do with your clients. Um, and especially in a DBT group where you can, you know, put this on a whiteboard and, and whiteboard this, which is really helpful. People usually jump right in and have all kinds of ideas on what these things mean, which is good. So what is this wise mind thing? So it's the integration of emotion mind and rational mind. It helps us grasp the whole picture. It helps us feel compassion. Uh, it's confident and assured in our decisions, truth and wisdom, the middle path. And when we choose to, to go down the path of using DBT skills, that takes us and helps us to get into wise mind. This is the place we want to try and be all the time. How many people are here all the time? No? Yeah. That makes sense, right? It's a hard place to be. So here we are, acceptance and change. Now, for those of you who know DBT, add the and, remove the... Yeah, remove the butt. Who was that over there? Excellent. Okay, someone knows their butt. We know in DBT, butt has to go. And you know how many times we actually use it in our daily life? Oh my goodness, I catch myself. We use it a lot. Uh, so it, th you can always replace it with and. So next time, the whole acceptance and change is and and not but. But diminishes everything you said before it. I love you, but. You're so great, but. Right? So let's overview skills. So here we are. So DBT is a, is a quadrant of skills. So we've got four quadrants. We've got our acceptance skills, mindfulness and distress tolerance, and we have our change skills, interpersonal effectiveness and uh, emotion regulation. So we're gonna talk about each of these quadrants and what skills that there are. So Marsha Linehan loves, loves her acronyms. So there's a lot of acronyms to help us to remember DBT. This is an amazing video to show parents and, uh, and kids. It actually goes to the whole thing on what full service DBT looks like. Group plus individual plus phone coaching plus team. Those are the four things that make a DBT DBT. If all those four things are not in place, Marshall and I would say you're not doing DBT. Hi, I'm Dr. Esme Schaller. I'm a clinical psychologist and I direct the DBT program at the Young Adult and Family Center at UCSF. I'm here to answer the question, what the heck is DBT? If you're watching this, someone has told you that you or a family member could benefit from something called DBT. The goal of this video is to explain quickly and simply what people mean when they say DBT, who DBT is designed to help, and what being in DBT treatment might actually look like. The main goal of DBT is to build a life worth living. This means having things that are meaningful and important to you in your life. So this could mean music to one person, horses to another, and a quiet room with lots of books to someone else. DBT is not a suicide prevention program or a way to stop people from doing behaviors that bother others. 
DBT is to help you. In other words, there is hope if you're suicidal. DBT is one way to overcome these feelings. Let's start with explaining those letters. Acronyms are always a bit confusing. The D stands for dialectical. This is a fancy philosophy word based on the idea of a dialectic, or two things that can seem like opposites but can in fact both be true at the same time. For example, in DBT, we believe that everyone is doing the best they can, and they need to try harder. We often think of dialectics as a great big scale, tilting back and forth. The main dialectic in DBT is that we are always trying to balance acceptance, you're doing the best you can, this is really how life is right now, with change. You have to try different things to get the life you want, you have to be motivated and work harder. A DBT therapist is thus constantly dancing, trying to make sure they really understand and accept where you're coming from, while also pushing you to change when they can. It can be a complicated step. The B stands for behavior. A behavior is anything that can be reinforced or rewarded. Okay, let me briefly explain reinforcement too. A reinforcer is anything that increases the likelihood that a behavior will occur again. If you study hard and get an A plus on a test, the A plus is the reinforcer that increases the chances you will study again. If your dog sits and you give him a treat, the treat is the reinforcer that increases the chance he will sit again. If you do a favor for a friend and he brings you a present to thank you, the present is the reinforcer that increases the chances you will do more favors in the future. The laws of behavior having to do with these reinforcers affect all living things, dogs, dolphins, people, even therapists. DBT recognizes this and tries to harness the power of behavior change to move you closer to your goals, your life worth living. In DBT, therapists work with you to establish target behaviors, things that you are working to increase or often in the beginning, decrease to make your life better. Common initial targets in DBT include thinking of suicide, self-injury, restricting meals, binging and purging, using drugs or alcohol, engaging in risky sexual behavior, reckless driving, physical aggression, and shoplifting. The T stands for therapy, obviously. But DBT is different from other therapies you may have participated in or heard of. DBT therapists have a lot of specialized training in DBT and follow many assumptions and guidelines in their work as DBT therapists that differ from other therapy traditions. All of this is a bit beyond the scope of this video, but I'll let you in on a couple. Our first goal in DBT is making sure you stay alive. This helps us meet our second goal, making sure you stay in therapy until you can meet your goal, which is by far the most important, building a life worth living. DBT therapists believe that the most caring thing a therapist can do is to help push a client toward their long-term goals. Sometimes these goals may seem unattainable. It is a DBT therapist's job to understand how hard it is to change and to simultaneously push you to keep you moving forward. DBT therapists also believe that therapy with someone is a real relationship between equals. That means if you ask your therapist a question about their lives, they'll likely just answer it honestly instead of asking you why you're interested. It also means that the work in therapy is carried out by both of you. It's like a DBT therapist is in a rowboat with you and you are both rowing to get to your destination. Your therapist shouldn't be laying back silently while you row super hard. And you also shouldn't be in the back of the boat drilling little holes in the bottom while your therapist is up front rowing, thinking you're rowing too. It's about both of you working together towards your goals. Now, who can benefit most from DBT? DBT has been studied and is currently being studied for a lot of different clinical populations. What most of them have in common is a difficulty in regulating emotions. This may mean that your life feels a bit like an emotional roller coaster. DBT might work for you if you get more disappointed than it seems like your friends do when plans get canceled or things don't go your way. You cry at movies a lot or even at commercials. You sometimes feel like you were born into the wrong family like you're a lion cub in a family of house cats. If one or more of these things describes you, you might benefit from DBT. Lastly, let's talk about what DBT looks like. Full DBT, the kind that has the most rigorous research backing it up, has four modes of treatment. These are, one, structured individual therapy. There is a focus on behaviors, like we mentioned, 
and dialectics, that balance of acceptance and change. You'll also be asked to do some tracking of your emotions and behaviors in between sessions. If you're a teen or sometimes a young adult, family therapy will also be included as part of your DBT program. Two, skills group. This is a weekly meeting, usually about two hours long, where you get to learn a different behavioral skill each week to help manage emotions, tolerate distress, and have effective interpersonal relationships. This saves time in your individual therapy to talk about the stuff that's most central to you. If you're a teen or young adult, you'll likely attend this group with a family member or two so they can learn the skills as well. Three, skills coaching. This means you can call your therapist 24 hours a day to get help using your coping skills and to avoid engaging in some of those target behaviors we mentioned earlier. You have a personal coach that can help you change how you react to things at times when it is the hardest to do so. Four, consultation team. This last one may be less obvious to you as the client, but DBT therapists work on a team, a team that helps them support each other and do the best treatment possible. This is essential because changing life-threatening behaviors that have been going on for a long time can be really stressful. If your DBT therapist does not have a team, it's not DBT. Altogether, this takes about three to four hours per week. Another goal of DBT is to keep you in your life, going to school, going to work, seeing your friends, so it does not take up all of your time like some other intensive treatment options might. So, you now know what the heck dialectical behavior therapy is. You've got the acronym down, you know a little bit about who it's designed to help, and you know what it involves. Only you can choose if this is the right road to your life worth living. Why not talk to a DBT therapist and see what you think? So there's our just reminding us of wise mind. So these are really good examples of, um, we've got rational mind, uh, wise mind, we've got emotion mind. And this is kind of fun. So we've got, oh, I forget his name, Big Bang Theory. What is this guy's name again? Okay, everyone knows. I don't watch it so much, but this is a funny clip. So essentially he goes through making friends with a flow chart. He's on the phone, he's trying to call, he's got, we can go for lunch. I suggest we go for, so it actually very rational, logical going through this flow chart. And at the end it says, how come Sheldon can't make friends? You're just in time. I believe I've isolated the algorithm for making friends. <laughs> Sheldon, there is no algorithm for making friends. Well, well, hear him out. If he's really onto something, we could open a booth at Comic-Con, make a fortune. <laughs> See, my initial approach to Kripke had the same deficiencies as those that plagued Stu the Cockatoo when he was new at the zoo. <laughs> Stu the Cockatoo? Yes, he's new at the zoo. <laughs> it's a terrific book. I've distilled its essence into a simple flow chart that will guide me through the process. Have you thought about putting him in a crate while you're out of the apartment? <laughs> Hello, Kripke. Yeah, Sheldon Cooper here. It occurred to me that you hadn't returned any of my calls because I hadn't offered any concrete suggestions for pursuing our friendship. Yeah, perhaps the two of us might share a meal together. <laughs> yeah, I see. Well, then perhaps you'd have time for a hot beverage. <laughs> Popular choices include tea, coffee, cocoa. I see. No, 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 wait, don't hang up yet. But what about a recreational activity? I bet we share some common interests. You tell me an interest of yours. You, really? On actual horses? <laughs> tell me another interest of yours. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I have no desire to get in the water till I absolutely have to. <laughs> Another interest of yours. Uh oh, he's stuck in an infinite loop. I can fix it. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's interesting, but isn't ventriloquism by definition a solo activity? <laughs> yeah. I mean, tell me another interest of yours. Hmm. Is there any chance you like monkeys? <laughs> yeah, what is wrong with you? Everybody likes monkeys. <laughs> Hang on, Kripke. A loop counter and an escape to the least objectionable activity. Howard, that's brilliant. I'm surprised you saw that. <laughs> Gee, why can't Sheldon make friends? <laughs> All right, Kripke, that last interest strikes me as the least objectionable, and I would like to propose that we do that together. Tomorrow. Yes, I'll pay. <laughs> All right, goodbye. All right. Time to learn rock climbing. <laughs> 
So this one is Inside Out. Everyone should have seen this this film. It's excellent. School was great, all right? What was that? I thought you said we were gonna act casual. Riley, is everything okay? <sighs> Sir, she just rolled her eyes at us. All right, make a show of force. I don't wanna have to put the foot down. No, not the foot. Riley, I do not like this new attitude. Oh, I'll show you attitude, old no, man. No, 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 breathe. What is your problem? Just leave me alone. Sir, reporting high levels of sass. Take it to DEFCON 2. DEFCON 2! I don't know where this disrespectful attitude came from. You want a piece of this, Pops? Yeah, well, look. Prepare the foot. Keys to safety position. Ready to launch on your command, sir. Just shut up! Fire. And then, of course, who, who more than Yoda to be in Wise Mind? <laughs> Strength flows from the force, but beware of the dark side. Anger, fear, aggression, the dark side of the force are they. Easily they flow, but to join you in a fight. If once you start down the dark path, forever will it dominate your destiny, consume you at will, as it did Obi-Wan's apprentice. Vader, is the dark side stronger? No. This year, more seductive. But how am I to know the good side from the bad? You will know when you are calm, at peace, passive. Mm. A Jedi uses the force for knowledge and defense. So this is also something that you can play with your with your clients or with, with a group. This would be done in a group. So it's a game that I developed called the Wise Mind Game. And essentially what you do is you group, you, you break out people into groups of three and you tell them secretly which one's emotion mind, rational mind, and wise mind. And then you give them all kinds of props like popsicle sticks and styrofoam cups and you tell them they need to build a house. And you tell them that rational mind is, can build very conservative house, don't spend too much money, don't make it fancy. Emotion mind, money's no object, go crazy, we have stickers, go nuts, be fancy and wise mind has to bring these two together. It is a lot of fun, and uh, we've actually taught it in agencies. Uh, we've played in agencies, and they've also found it very, so for kids or for adults alike, this game is a lot of fun to really see what are these mind states, and what are they like? Mindfulness. So I love this cell phone study. So mind watering, wandering. So here's a mindfulness. This is a study where they call people randomly and ask them three questions. What are you doing right now? What are you thinking about right now? And how happy are you on a scale of one to 10? So can you imagine the people who were thinking about what they were doing in the moment were happier consistently? So if our mind is wandering when we're doing the dishes to what we need to do next or to the argument we have with, with our partner or to the, the, you know, the issues at work, we're actually not as happy as if we were actually thinking about doing the dishes. Who knew? So next time you're doing the dishes, think about doing the dishes. What does it feel like on your hands to have the warm water? What does it feel like to actually put them in the dishwasher? You know, the soap, you got, you got smells, you got vision, you got touch, you have a lot of senses there to focus on. And we're happier and more mindful and less anxious if we're focusing on our senses and dropping into our body. So this is really what mindfulness is sort of at the crux of it. And I love this study because it kind of speaks to, hey, we need to think about what we're doing and be mindful of what we're doing all the time and we'll actually be happier. No need to think about that to-do list in the moment. When you're thinking about the to-do list, you can be mindful about that. But when you're doing the dishes, you can be mindful about that. So mindfulness is a set of the what and the how skills. So, and, and, and there's, there's no acronyms in this one, but there's several things under the what and the how. So we have just observe, describe, and participate. So these are the three skills under the what skills. And Marsha structures mindfulness in a way that is a little more digestible. So just observe is all about observing without words, which is the hardest thing here. How do you observe without words? It's just feeling in the body because our, our mind just wants to put words to everything. 
And then describe is name entertainment, so putting words to things. So if you were to be do a mindfulness exercise, closing your eyes, you would just sort of watch what flows by in your mind and just describe it with words. Whereas with a just observe, you could do the same thing, but just observe the sensations in your body and not your, uh, your thoughts. Participate is jumping right in and fully participating in whatever you're doing. <coughs> the how skills. How do we do our mindfulness? So non-judgmentally, and there's a whole piece in DBT about judgments, which is really cool. Because judgments, um, I know in a DBT group at CAMH, they, way back before apps, they had the, the clients carry around clickers and click every time they had a judgment. And it's amazing how many judgments that one can have in a day. We have so many judgments in a day. And so being able to just be mindful of our judgments, because I believe judgments take li years off our life. It doesn't feel good to be judging people, right? It doesn't. It feels better to have compassion for people. So getting into that place of, of compassion is such a better place to be than in a place of judgment. One mindfully and effectively. Effectively is about doing things now that support your long-term goals because right now in the moment, sometimes we feel like doing something like getting angry at someone that actually isn't effective because we actually maybe want to maintain a relationship with that person as opposed to getting angry and pushing them away. So being effective is about seeing your long-term goals and following, following them. So distress tolerance. We've now gone through mindfulness. So now we're going to move into the distress tolerance quadrant. So distress tolerance is about crisis survival. It's about when you're in a place where things are so intense that you need to do some skills that are going to bring down arousal. Some more quickly, some a little more slowly. Uh, we tell people that this isn't a change skill, right? This is a, an acceptance skill. This is accepting that we have distress in the moment and saying this is the moment I'm having. My computer crashed a couple weeks ago and of course, as you can imagine, I'm sure some of you feel anxiety just hearing that. Um, I hadn't done a backup for about six months, although I managed to get some files off. And I remember thinking, I can't imagine I would not have reacted this way before I knew DBT because I was so calm. I was like, why am I so calm? I was thinking to myself, this is happening right now. This is happening, and right now. <laughs> and, that, and that's what I keep telling myself, and it's like I didn't feel the anxiety. I could have felt a lot of things, right? This is terrible, this sucks, what am I gonna do? Oh my God, freaking out. And that would not have helped. And so without DBT skills and radical acceptance, which we're gonna talk about, I, I would have been a lot more off the rails. So crisis survival skills, they don't fix your life. They're not meant to change things. They're not skills that make you feel better right away, although there is one we're gonna talk about that I believe does feel, make you feel better right away. And they prevent the situation from getting worse. So it may not get better, but let's not make it worse. So that's what distress tolerance is all about. So when do we use crisis survival skills? When we have intense pain, when we wanna act in emotion mind, and when we're feeling overwhelmed. So these are some reasons why we might wanna use them. So. There's a video here we're not going to watch. However, it is a really great video for kids uh, and adults. I think they're great all around. It talks about the thalamus being the data analyst. So when information comes in, the data analyst, the thalamus, takes that in, starts processing it. And then the amygdala steps in and makes some decisions. And then you can either take the, the fast road, which is the low road to the security guard, which is your amygdala and, oh, my God, things are going on. And, or you can take the high road or the slower road, and then you're with mission control, which is sort of medial prefrontal cortex and helps to sort of slowly bring things back in line. So it's a really great video. Let's have a look at what's going on inside the brain when people have been traumatized that leads to these exaggerated fight or flight responses, that leads to these kind of outbursts of anger and aggression or these kind of exaggerated startle responses and so forth. And I'm going to introduce you to four metaphors, which I hope will be helpful to you in, in remembering what goes on here. So I'm going to talk about the data analyst, the emergency alarm, the mission control, and the security guard. So let's talk first of all about the data analyst. This is the thalamus, an important part of the emotional brain. The thalamus gathers data together from the external world and the internal world. So all the data that's coming to you through your five senses, what you can see and hear and touch and taste and smell, 
all converges on the thalamus. All the stuff that's coming from your internal world, your proprioception about where your body is, the state of your muscles, what's going on in your digestive system, your heart rate, your respiratory rate. So all of this info about the internal world and the external world converges in the thalamus, which is like a sort of data analyst, puts it all together. And the data analyst sends that information off in two different directions. There's a slower pathway, which is often referred to as the high road, and there's a faster pathway, which is often referred to as the low road. Now, let's have a look at the fast low road pathway. The data analyst sends this information as fast as possible to the emergency alarm. This is the amygdala. The amygdala is like the emergency alarm of your brain. Uh, if it detects a kind of threat, uh, whether it's a, a real threat or whether it's a perceived threat, it fires off. Woo, 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 danger, 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 danger. And it has to do that job well. If you've got a defective emergency alarm that doesn't go off at the slightest hint of a, a, a threat, then you're not going to live very long. If we look back in evolutionary times to caveman days, if there was a caveman whose amygdala did not fire off at the slightest sign of a threat, then he got eaten pretty quickly. So the thalamus collates this data, the data analyst sends it at lightning speed to the amygdala, the emergency alarm of your brain, which fires off and sends a message down to your security guard. Your security guard is your sympathetic nervous system. The security guard needs to either take cover or shoot. You know, what's most important? Do I shoot, you know, the kind of fight stuff, or do I take cover? Now, that's the fast road. That's often called the low road because it's using the lower parts of the brain. If we come back to Dan Siegel's hand model of the brain, the high road involves the parts of the brain that are closest to or part of the cerebral cortex. The low road involves the kind of lower parts of the brain neuroanatomically. And so your amygdala is right here in your emotional brain and it's sending that information, the alarm's gone off, it's sending that information down to the security guard, the kind of fight or flight sympathetic response, the lower part of your brain. Now that's much, much faster than the high road that basically the thalamus sends this information at the same time to what we might call mission control. So mission control is the medial prefrontal cortex. This bit of your brain that's right up front, just above your eyes, this is like mission control. It gathers all the data together and it makes an informed response. You become aware of what's happening. You uh, can tap into different parts of your cerebral cortex and make an informed decision about whether or not this is a real genuine threat that you need to take action on or whether it was a perceived fret and you're actually okay. So that's quite a few microseconds slower than the, the low road fast response. The amygdala or the emergency alarm also sends information to uh, mission control. And again, though, that's slower than the immediate response that's gone to the Hello. security guard. And so what's happening in the traumatized brain is that the data analyst is continually feeding inaccurate data to the overactive emergency alarm, which is firing off again and again and telling the security guard over and over to take cover or shoot. And so we're getting this kind of sympathetic hyper arousal, this kind of anger, irritability, or fear and startle and withdrawal and retreat over and over again. Throughout the course, I'll be referring to these metaphors and these parts of the brain, and really don't worry too much if, you, if it seems too much or you can't remember all these bits and pieces. You know, it's useful knowledge to have, and sometimes it's useful to share this with your clients as part of psychoeducation, but it's not something that you have to kind of really struggle with if you're finding it difficult to store this in your long-term memory. And uh, keep in mind that a lot of what we're doing uh, throughout this course is working with the medial prefrontal cortex of the brain. When we're doing this mindfulness stuff, this grounding, this centering, this self-compassion, this kind of cognitive diffusion, and all of these core mindfulness processes, we're, we're coming back to this medial prefrontal cortex of the brain. STOP! Now we're going to get into the acronyms. Distress Tolerance has several of them. So STOP is an acronym, Marsh's acronym. It's, uh, so the first one, STOP. So as soon as you realize you're about to go over the edge, stop in your tracks, don't move. 
Um, it just freeze is another way we describe this. So when you do this, you're already practicing DBT. So it's just taking a breath before we react. Let's just stop and let's just take a breath. Then we take a step back from the situation to get a broader perspective. We take a deep breath in and slowly, slowly exhale, pushing the air out. Do this a couple of times, set your intention. Then we have O, observe, so now notice and name things. You're aware of both inside and outside. Use I statements, I'm feeling, I'm perceiving. So there's your observe, there's your mindfulness, right? Let's just observe. This could be observing things going on externally, as well as let's observe things that are going on internally, what's going on in our body, using our senses. And then we have proceed mindfully. So remembering your attention to be in wise mind and your long-term median goals, so remember you're being effective in the mindfulness set of skills. And so you might select a skill to move forward instead of what you're, yeah. So this is your proceed mindfully. So this is the stop skill. So when things are really heightened, <coughs> distress, you can stop, you talk to your students and clients about how do you stop before reacting, which is super hard to do. This I make it sound easy, but it really isn't. You know, when we're reactive, when we're in our amygdala, it's super hard to, to try and, and, and stop. So the tip skill, standing for temperature, intense exercise, pace, breathing, and progressive muscle relaxation. So I any one of these could be used when things are super intense, especially temperature. So uh, these are the skills that you use when things are really, really intense, right? Maybe a student's crying, can't regulate, screaming, uh, all of those things, acting out in anger, yelling. This is the time where you might want to use some of these skills. So temperature, we're going to get to, so temperature is the cold water, and we're going to get to a slide that I think is pretty cool. And so intense exercise might be just getting up. And when I teach this in a classroom or in, a, in my group, I usually have temperature ice packs. And I understand you guys have ice packs in the freezer that you could use. An ice pack on the forehead or even just holding it can be a distraction. We're going to talk about how it actually does extra things when you put it on your forehead. And then pace breathing is like a box breathing, which I'm sure many of you are aware of. Or it might be like the four, like a breathe in for four, out for seven. Because we know when we exhale, we stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calming part of our nervous system. So if we exhale longer than the inhale, so that's what the pace breathing is all about. And then progressive muscle relaxation is all about tensing and releasing, you know, starting with the head. So many of you would know what that is in terms of doing a meditation where it's tensing and then relaxing. So these are the tip skills. So we've gone through this one, temperature. This one is fascinating. So we know that cold water, right here on the forehead, there's a, what's called a vagus or a vagal nerve. And when you dunk your head or put an ice pack, is the best way to do this is literally dunk your face in cold water, freezing cold water with ice cubes, which is not that easy to do. Uh, when I've done it, and just so you know, I found it difficult to put my whole face in the water, I just put my forehead and I could still breathe here. And I actually watched my heart rate and we're gonna uh, take a look at this. It came down by 30 points with under a minute. So if you use the cold water here, you can bring your heart rate down really quickly. And there's a video which I, I won't show, but I've got pictures and so that you can see. So you do this by dunking face in cold water, an ice pack on the forehead, a cold shower, or this isn't so crazy. I mean, how many movies have we watched where what happens to the character when they're stressed? They go and splash water on their face, right? There's something to this. So. Here is a video which is fascinating. So if you can see, here's someone dunking their head in cold water, and here's his heart rate, 74. And when you watch this video, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. His heart rate actually gets down to 43. This guy must be in some great shape. But his, his heart rate actually gets down to 43, and, and probably within maybe a minute and a half. So you watch the video, it's pretty awesome. So I had to try it, of course, because I thought, well, I'm going to try this with the heart rate. I've done the dunking before, and then I had wondered how it made me feel, but I'd never seen the heart rate before. So I was sold. I just couldn't believe it. I had a friend standing next to me, and he was like, I was at 125 to start with, and I was at 94 in under a minute. And I could just feel, you know, because it's uncomfortable to have your heart going that fast. I could just feel it or to, to sort of slip away. It was, it was an incredible experience. So this is an amazing thing. 
Um, and here we talked a little bit about this, the breath there's breathing <coughs> apps that you can use and, and all kinds of things here that I put down here, Calm, Headspace, Oak. I use the Aura. Aura is like a little three minute meditations. Lots of apps for this. And then progressive muscle relaxation. So we're this is a really great uh, video as well that you can use for just doing some uh, progressive muscle relaxation. So tensing things and, and releasing things. To begin this exercise, first, Find a comfortable place to sit or lie down. Loosen any tight clothing. Now begin to breathe slowly and deeply. Imagine that your lungs are like a bottle and you are filling them from the bottom up. Breathe in through your nose to the count of five, and out through your mouth to the count of seven. Don't worry if you can't reach seven at first, just do what you can. The more you practice, the easier it will become. Now let's begin the exercise, starting with your face. Push your eyebrows together in a deep frown for a few seconds. And then relax. Now focus on your neck. Let your head fall forward gently towards your chest. Hold it for a few seconds and then lift it slowly. We bring the focus now to your shoulders. How do we know if crisis survival skills are working? How do we know if our clients, our students, um, know that they're working. So how to know if crisis survival skills are working? Time passes and you haven't done anything to make things worse. This is a good one, right? Time passes, we're not making things worse. This is a good sign that we're not in, ra in, not in emotion mind, right? Time has passed, we're still okay. You know, how many of us have made situations worse on many occasions because we weren't in wise mind, right? This is true even if you don't feel better. Yes, you may not feel better. This is a good thing to know. I mean, I think the tip skill usually helps people feel better, but that's why we teach so many tools and tricks because then people have other things to pull from their bag. Clients often say, well, that didn't work, and I, tr I tried it. And I say, okay, so what else could we try? What other things could we pull out of your toolbox and, and give a try? Or trying them again in a, in a few minutes. So you start feeling more able to tolerate the problem. This is a good one. When we start feeling calmer, like the computer crashing, this is happening. To figure this out, rate your distress tolerance from zero. I can't tolerate it to 100, although this is painful, I can de definitely tolerate it. It's actually a good idea to do these SUDS ratings, one to 100, maybe before you engage in a distress tolerance skill, and then maybe you could ask your, your clients, and of course for yourself, where are you at after you've used a skill? So maybe you start at a 90 and you end up at a 50. And really gauge which skills actually help you to you know, move, move down faster on those ratings. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through these. Again, it's an acronym. So this is a distress tolerance acronym called ACCEPTS. And so we've got activities, contributing, I like this one because you know when you feed someone and you get fed, do you actually have oxytocin, more oxytocin in your brain? And, and what is oxytocin good for? Calming, yeah, what else? It improves the mood. It improves mood, yes. It's the love hormone, the trust. It helps us trust. So if so, next time someone offers you something to eat, don't deprive them of their oxytocin. <laughs> so comparisons, this is just making comparisons to a, a previous time or maybe to uh, making comparisons for, for those that may be less fortunate. This one can be a little risky. Sometimes we're really sensitive to comparing ourselves to others and feel pain of others. So... 
Um, it's other emotions, doing things that actually change your emotion, watching a comedy, pushing your thoughts away temporarily. This is a good one. You know, uh, that we don't need to, you know, we don't need to look at these right now. It's just temporary. We'll bring them back later. Other thoughts, doing a puzzle. If we do a puzzle, it actually helps pull us into rational mind. So if we do anything that, that needs or requires rational mind, so that's when you're, you know, you have a student or, or a client who's really, you know, in that emotion mind place. And if you say, okay, let's sit down and do a puzzle together. This would be a good way to just pull them over more into rational mind. And hopefully they stop in the middle and, and pull them more into wise mind. So anything that uses the rational part of the brain moves us out of emotion mind. Is the physiology. A lot of this stuff is physiology. So other sensations, this is, you know, aromatherapy, this kind of thing. Now, IMPROVE is another acronym. So we've got another set of, of uh, distress tolerance skills under IMPROVE. So uh, it's about shifting our mindset gently towards the positive with the aid of relaxation and pleasant experiences. So we've got imagery. So using imagery uh, to sort of calm and soothe ourselves. Here's some sort of ideas. And meaning, Marshall Linehan talks about making lemonade out of lemons. <coughs> So making meaning of things so that we can, I cope a lot like this. I, I think, okay, so what is the meaning of this? Even with the worst of situations, how can I make meaning out of this and turn it into something positive? Because a lot of us can, you know, have things happen and think, well, there's no meaning. There's no rhyme or reason. There's no cause. And Marshall Linehan will talk about how there's always a cause. There's always a cause. We just may not know it. But there's always a cause for everything that happens in our lives and in others. Prayer, so we have prayer. Um, we do a loving kindness meditation, which is, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of this. You know, it starts with, may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be free from harm, and, and then it's, you know, may you be happy, may you be healthy. And going through this until you get to a point where you're wishing kindness and, and warmth to someone who's hurt you. So you start with something small, uh, I, you know, wishing you love, wishing you kindness, wishing you free from harm you know may you be loved and then you move to someone that's hurt you say it again may they be happy may they be healthy may they be free from harm until you kind of get to someone and i usually keep it small for people like let's not go to our major traumas right off the bat let's start small but that's what the loving kindness is all about and it helps bring us to a place of compassion i teach this often to parents because oftentimes parents especially if they have a dysregulated child or a child who has mental health challenges they have a really tough time and so helping them to come to compassion. I say that in our family group, the biggest thing we're selling is compassion. Because once a parent has compassion for their child who's having challenges, everything else can flow from there very easily. So if you're having trouble with compassion for your partner, for your friend, for anyone, do these loving kindness meditations. It really helps to come to that. And there's tons of them online. Relaxation, massage, listening to music, whatever that might be. One thing in the moment, this is kind of like participate, jumping fully in, being mindful. Vacation, this isn't necessarily a take off to Spain vacation. It's more a staycation. Some people like walk around the block. That could be a little vacation just away from the moment. Sometimes with my clients, I do coaching calls. And so I'm always coming up with creative ways when I have a client who calls me and says, you know, I'm in distress and I need help. And a coaching call is a very brief sort of intervention where you, 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 okay, what skills can we use in the moment? Let's think about this together. And then we come up with a plan on the skill they're going to use, and then I usually text them later to confirm and to reinforce the behavior. So vacation could be walking around with the ice cube or a pack of ice. And I've actually walked around the block with my clients a few times. I'm like, I'm gonna walk with you. I'm heading out my door. I've got my phone. We're gonna walk around together and we're gonna soothe ourselves. So coming up with creative ways on how, how to help clients, I'm always looking for creative ways. Encouragement, so this is our negative self-talk, how could we change that? Distress tolerance kit. So this is something that, part of DBT, where we actually put together a box, and I think everyone should have one of these boxes, a distress tolerance box. We have one in our group and we put it out so people can can use and touch and use their senses and we put things in it like aromatherapy, pictures of better times, uh, pictures of family and holidays and friends. Uh, you could use all the senses. So here's some examples of some boxes, but here is you would put in your distress tolerance box. So you could put some things around temperature, intense exercise, pace, breathing. So you could put an ice pack in there to remind yourself, although the ice pack needs to be in the freezer, so maybe you have two. 
you could have uh, remind yourself to do a progressive muscle relaxation. The point being is that we forget in the moment when we have distress that we have a whole toolbox to use. So having a box that you can put in your kitchen on the table or you can have in your office for clients is super helpful. So just holding something in your hand sometimes can just make a really big difference. So anything in the accept skills or the improve skills, anything related to that? I have like a one of those, uh, what do you call them? You know, you look into them and they make oh, it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I have one of these and I, whenever I teach imagery, I'll think of that. And so, you know, having something like that might be um, relaxation, uh, you, encouragement. You could have a gratitude list for that one in your distress tolerance box. You've written a gratitude list. So hopefully as I was talking, you're thinking about what can I put in my distress tolerance box? What do I have in my house? A dollar store is a great place to go to actually pick up some stuff for a distress tolerance box. I've seen clients come in with a big box and they're so, they're so excited when we teach this. They come in with their box the next week and they want to show everybody. And they've also got a little one for their purse. So a little tiny one. So I've really seen clients do well with this distress tolerance box. It's the remembering to use it, right? You know, that's where the stop comes in. Sticky notes around the house. I tell clients to, to put sticky notes to remind themselves you have a distress tolerance box, you have skills on the mirror in the bathroom, wherever it takes. All right, we've come to emotion regulation. So we've now talked about two. We talked about mindfulness and distress tolerance. So now we're going to move into emotion regulation skills. So what is emotion regulation? So it's using skills very different from distress tolerance. Emotion regulation is, and there, there, it seems like there's some overlap, but distress tolerance is when you're in a crisis in the moment, what skills would you use? Emotion regulation is more proactive. What can I do on a daily basis to make sure that I keep my baseline low so that when stress hits me, I'm not way up here already? So what can we do? And there's uh, Marshall on hand again with the please skills, although we'll talk about ABC first. So. The ABC is accumulate the positives, build mastery, and cope ahead. So this skill set is about becoming less vulnerable, which is all about what emotion regulation is about. So how do we become less vulnerable? Because when we're vulnerable, we, we end up you know, more likely to be in, in emotion mind, more likely to act out and, and have um, less impulse control. So accumulate the positives, so try to do one pleasant thing a day. And I should say that Marsha Linehan has tons of worksheets, a whole book. You could teach DBT over and over and over for years. There's so many worksheets that you can do with clients. So I suggest for those of you who want to bring DBT into your practice that you buy the workbook with the worksheets because uh, we use worksheets for home practice each group and we expect that people are you know, doing some home practice and taking away some sheets. And then you've got a point of discussion when they come back with their sheets filled out. So uh, long-term positives, a life worth living. Marsha Linehan is saying cultivating lives worth living. She talks about that a lot. Building mastery, so doing activities that make us feel competent and effective. So many people think motivation equals action equals success. In this case, it's more action equals feeling mastery and that in, in turn motivates <laughs> us and then there's more action. So here's the please skills. Um, the PL is a little bit of a stretch, but I think it's please help yourself on a daily basis <laughs> regulate. Uh, but our please stands for the first one, PL, treat physical illness. So making sure to take the time you need, see doctors, you know, take your medication as prescribed, this kind of thing. So that's something that you can do on a daily basis to make sure that you're staying healthy. We've got eating and drinking, which some of this is very straightforward, but you know what? We forget this stuff constantly, right? How many of us forget when stress gets really bad and we're, we're trying to cope and things are really out of control. And then we realize, oh my goodness, I didn't sleep well last night. I didn't eat breakfast this morning, right? I had that, I should really go see the doctor about this problem, my knee. And so we forget about this stuff. So as, as straightforward as it is, we really do forget to take care of ourselves and, and do self-care. So we've got sleep. We teach a whole thing on, uh, Marsha Linehan has nightmare protocols in her workbook. Uh, sleep hygiene, this kind of thing. So there's a lot to teach in, in, in around sleep. So interpersonal effectiveness. Marsha Linehan has a very structured way of talking about how to be interpersonally effective. And a lot of the time our clients have real challenge in this, in this area. And it makes sense that they have challenges in this area because if they're not regulated, if they're constantly in a state of fight or flight, how on earth can you have a, a relationship and be interpersonally effective? So these, these skills are, are, are really important. And what's really important before we start practicing these is to 
to practice the distress tolerance, the emotion regulation. That's why we don't teach this skill until near the end. This is not a good skill to start with because it really requires that one be more in wise mind before they jump into being interpersonally effective. Especially since it, when we start trying some of these skills, we're met with resistance from home and family. People are like, What's, what are they doing? This is so different. And so it's a good skill to make sure that you teach later on in the process. So DEAR, D-E-A-R, this is a structure for getting your needs met for healthy relationship building. Uh, how do we structure things in a way that actually help us to meet our needs and not push the other person away or have the other person listen to us? How many times have we said something in a way where maybe someone wasn't listening to us because we didn't use a structured statement? We didn't talk about what's in it for them if they, if they actually follow through with your request. So this is pretty amazing skill. It really does help to try and help you to ask for things in a way that, that helps you to get them met. So describe. So describe is about describing the current situation without judgment. So no, at this point you're not, I feel this, I feel frustrated. At this point you're saying, I, you know, I notice that, I notice that often, uh, often I try and stay away from using you as well because you usually sets people off. As soon as you say you, you someone's back is up already. So. There's a lot of tweaking that goes on with these, even though I'm, I've gone through them several times, it's usually an exercise with a pencil. Writing them out, no, that's not quite right, wait, I'm gonna change this. So actually, it takes a bit of time to think, that's why I tell clients to plan ahead on this. If they have a situation they know that they're gonna go into where they wanna ask for something, that they, they write this out beforehand. I remember one time when I was learning DBT skills long ago, I sat in my car, I can't remember, I think I was, I think I was seeing a boyfriend and I, it was a difficult conversation. I can't remember now what it was, but I was really stressed out and I thought, how am I gonna ask for this or how am I gonna say this? And I sat in the car writing out my dear statement and then I tell clients, it, there's no shame in actually reading straight from the paper once you've actually written your dear statement. There's no shame in this because what happens when we're dysregulated and we're trying to ask for our needs to get met and it's highly emotional, we're likely to go off on a tangent and never finish our dear statement and never get to what we need because we never asked for it in a way that was effective. So I tell my clients there's no shame in doing that. So express your feelings or opinions. This is where you would say, I feel, or you know, uh, this sort of, this has me feeling frustrated or anxious or or whatever have you in terms of expressing your feelings or opinions. Assert your need using I statements and keeping out the you. I want you, it's more like, I would really like to see the cupboard doors closed in, or closed in the kitchen after you leave the kitchen. As opposed to, you stop leaving the cupboard doors open. This drives me crazy. I can't stand it. Close the doors, right? This is not probably gonna be so effective. One of my colleagues had a hard time with this about her husband not closing the doors, drove her crazy. And she was going on and on and finally she realized it wasn't an argument worth having uh, and to sort of choose her priorities, but she did get some success with using a deer statement. <coughs> Lastly, reinforce. Uh, we usually don't do things that aren't in it for us. Not that we're all selfish, but we really wanna know if I do this for you, what's in it for me? And often what's in it for you is just feeling good. You've just met someone's request. It doesn't have to be an ice cream. It could just be you know, feeling good, having a better relationship, getting closer and connected with someone. All of those things are a good reinforcer. So pointing those out is super important. So here's an example, and then we're gonna do an example of our own in groups. So here is an is a example where the person just got home and there wasn't a parking spot for them. The parking spot was, was taken, someone was in their spot. So we describe, in the parking lot, there is a single spot assigned to each, each apartment. I'm new and I have noticed that often others are parked in my spot. Because of this, I often have to park on the street, which affects my schedule. Do you see any judgments there? Right, it's just the facts. That's all we're doing at this point, just the facts. Not our opinions, just the facts. So express, I have been feeling disappointed and annoyed that the parking spot assigned to me is frequently occupied by someone else. So there is the feelings, right? Now here's where you, the need comes in. So this is your assert. You assert, I need my designated spot kept open for me. And here's where we're not going, oh, you know, I kind of wish, just please, you know, maybe you could move your car out of the spot, I don't know. You know, you know, being confident, standing confidently, 
asserting what your need is, being very clear is really important here. So here's an exercise. You go to a school to do an assessment or counseling and they don't have a space for you to work. <laughs> so what I'd like you to do is break into, let's do threes again. And I'd like you to come up with a dear statement on how to ask for space to work in. So if we break into threes, write out your dear statement, describe, express, assert, reinforce. I'll put this back up here so that you can see it. And I'd be very excited to hear your dear statements when you're finished. So maybe like three, four minutes, you can come up with a dear statement. I'm so excited. <laughs> see, here are some of your dear statements. Let's listen to two. Two brave groups are gonna share their dear statements. Who are they going to be? Don't be shy. Have we got one? Here, we've got one. Okay, everyone listening? Describe. The other day I arrived at my school to test a student and the room that I had booked was taken. That was described. That was a good describe. Everyone think so? Yes, I loved it. Yes. E excellent. Express. I feel frustrated because the room is often unavailable and I feel pressured to get my work done and I can't be as efficient or productive as I would like to be at your school. Assert. To be more productive and provide services to the school, I will need a space. Reinforce. If I have a space that is available to me, I will be able to see more students at your school and hopefully shorten the list so your students won't have to wait so long for services. That is amazing. That was amazing. Yes. That was like totally awesome. So one other group would like to share their dear statement? <laughs> yeah, the pressure, no pressure here. That one was so good. Okay, you got it? Complete dear statement. When I come to school, it is hard for me to find a space and it is difficult for me to work with the students. When this is happening, I feel frustrated because I can't do the work I need to do. I would like to have a space available since I want to ensure your students get services and you won't get complaints from parents. Can you help me with this? Oh, I love it. I love the question. That was really good. I love the question. You know, when we use questions, oftentimes it's a lot softer, right? It would be hard to say no to either of those. Right? Right. Good job. Radical acceptance, I talked about that earlier. This is, uh, my two favorite skills are radical, radical acceptance and opposite emotion action. Those are my two favorite skills. Radical acceptance has saved me and my clients many times over. It really is the hardest skill to learn, however. So we're gonna watch just a little clip of Marsha. Sort of sounds like I'm saying if you can change your thinking, everything will be all right, right? It does sound that way, but it's not true. Now, acceptance is a lot easier if you can't change your thinking, but that's not all there is to it, especially not with radical acceptance. The whole idea in radical acceptance is you've got to accept all the way. You accept with your mind, you accept with your heart, you accept with your body. Now, how would you do that? Well, the short answer is you practice. What do you practice? Well, what you want to practice is letting go. You're going to let go of tension, tightness. Let go of your muscles. You know how when you're not accepting how you get all tense? Face gets tense, your arms get tense, your hands get tense. Have you ever noticed that? People get sick to their stomach when they're not accepting. I mean, it's all around. Your whole body just tightens up. So if you want to accept, start with just letting go. You can start letting go of your forehead, letting go of your eyes, letting go of your cheeks, letting go of your jaw, letting go of your shoulders, letting go of your arms, letting go of your stomach, your legs, your calves, your feet. Just start letting go. The social worker example, and I've seen this so many times that I can actually describe it. I actually started talking like Marsha one day. I was like, oh my goodness, I've watched these videos so many times. So she talks about getting a job as a, as a, uh, in an agency and she hoped it was a social worker job. 
So she gets there and it turns out it's a typing job. She came to the point where it's like, but this isn't a social work job. And so she had to radically accept that this is the job she was given. It wasn't a social work job. And we talk about accepting. If we accept something, then we can change it. The idea that if we can first accept it, we can change it. If we don't accept it, we, we can't change it. So we often do an exercise with this one where I hand out cards that say your bike was stolen, the bus is behind, you're late for work. And then I help people at the beginning to say, okay, now I want you to just think about this with as much resistance and non-acceptance as you possibly can muster. And they, they think about it. And then once we teach radical acceptance, we do the same scenarios again and we say, okay, so now we've learned radical acceptance. Let's look at these again. Your bike's been stolen, you're late for work. Now, now that you're accepting, what are the feelings and thoughts? So it's a really great exercise to do with people. If you can come up with some really simple scenarios, nothing big, and then help people, okay, okay, so if we radically accept these things are happening, then we're more likely, like for instance, in this video, Marsha talks about the purple house. And so people are moving into this house. They, they, they were supposed to be painted white or another color and by the owner. And so the day they moved in, it's still purple. And they, the person who walks in the house and says, oh, it's purple. I didn't want it to be purple. What's going on? This is unfair. I want out of this house. I don't want to buy this house. But of course, you've bought this house. So the person who walks in and accepts that the house is purple is the one who's Ugh, I'm really disappointed. I didn't want the house to be purple. Let's go to the nearest paint store. So who's the person who can actually, you know, change the situation? The person who's wandering around yelling and screaming, this isn't fair, right? Not accepting that the house is still purple. Or the person who accepts the purple house and says, okay, I accept this. This is what's happening. This is my life right now. How can I change it? So accepting doesn't mean you agree with it, like it, or endorse it. It just means it is what it is. So we don't want to get caught up in that. That is why the skill is so hard to learn, because as soon as you tell someone to accept something, they say, I'm not accepting that. That's not right. I don't agree with that. Why on earth would I accept that? So you need to kind of change your definition of acceptance, right? It's just accepting the moment. It's just saying yes to the moment. Yes, this is the moment I'm having right now. I don't like it, I don't agree with it, but I accept it, because it is what it is. We have no other choice. Life is happening, this is the moment. There's no other moments. So opposite action. Opposite action is about changing our, our emotions, sending the different signals to the brain, so that if we are angry, sad, depressed, that we are going to do something and do opposite to what we think. So we're really depressed, we decide to watch a comedy. It's the hardest thing to do, right? Because it's the last thing we want to do. We're really depressed. We may want to listen to sad music. We listen to happy dancing music. So it's literally doing the opposite of, of what you feel like doing. I remember driving to the gym once and thinking, oh, I'm going to go work out. And I get there, and there's no parking underground at the gym. And the parking was like across the street in the mall. And I decided I couldn't go to the gym because of the walk I had to do, which was a little ridiculous because I, <laughs> right? I, I was going to work out anyway and I couldn't actually walk from the parking lot to the gym. So there would have been a good opportunity for me to practice what? Opposite emotion action. I didn't feel like going to the gym. I'm going to go anyway. Right? So that's what opposite action is. And Marshalina has a, a good video um, on this that's really good to watch. That's this is kind of fun. Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. <laughs> my life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's all been wrong. <laughs> Tuna on toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. <laughs> I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad on rye. <laughs> Untoasted with a side of potato salad and a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna because salmon swim against the current and the tuna swim with it. Good for the tuna. Uh, George, 
You know, that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> yes. I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered the same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. <laughs> I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> So let's share how you used, used opposite action in the past or could use it in the future. So just let's just pair up this time and share with your neighbor um, some way that you could use opposite action for yourself, either in the past that you could have or in the future. Think of something and share it with your neighbor. Something that maybe in the future is good because you know what happened? We commit to ourselves when we say it out loud, right? So we're going to talk about validation. face. You've got powerful features, man. Anyone ever tell you that? Um, no. Then listen, you look a little down, and it may seem like sometimes people don't understand you. But someday, man, someday, people are going to see you for what you really are. You, you really think so? Absolutely. You are great. Need a validation, please? You. You are great, ma'am. You have amazing cheekbones. Really? Sir, yes. We have a situation. Where? Oh my gosh, you have Six months over. What the hell's going on? You've been through it. You know. You've had so much life experience that other people don't appreciate, but you know. Bless you, dear. So this is really, really fun. He goes on to validate so many people, and then all of a sudden he's got this huge, long lineup of people who all want to get validated. Uh -huh. And then management comes in saying, what's going on? Wants to get them in, tr get them in trouble. This is a business. What are you doing? And all of a sudden he says, you look amazing. <laughs> Your suit is so awesome. And then these managers are like, really? What? Anyway, it's so much fun. And then there's the rest of a story with a woman he meets, and she works in, a, in the license place and in the, the, you know, the DMV because it's from the States. And, of course, no one smiles in the pictures. Or, so he goes through this whole thing trying to, trying to make a relationship with someone who don't smile and he can't validate and make smiles. So it's a really cool video, and it's, I think it's really good for representing validation in a fun way. So validation is an acceptance-based skill versus a change strategy like problem solving. It emphasizes the kernel of truth in a behavior, thought, emotion, your own or others, and acknowledges that something makes sense. That's my favorite thing. When I validate, I got some go-tos. I validate by saying, that makes sense. Or, you know, maybe with kids, that sucks, right? Saying something that sort of brings them on where it's like, okay, they understand me. This is awful. It's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it? I mean, years ago, we were taught in such an invalidating, and we still live in a very invalidating environment, but we're learning, right? We now know that it's, it's better to actually say to someone, that sucks, that's terrible, that's horrible. I would feel horrible too if that happened to me. 
where years ago we might have said, ah, what are you talking about? You're fine. It's all good. You shouldn't feel that way, right? Now we know that that's harmful. We know that that doesn't help. We know that we want to acknowledge the pain. We want to acknowledge it. It doesn't bring it out any anymore like you'd think. It actually soothes it because someone understands, someone understands you and says, you know, that makes sense. And oftentimes our clients may not know the, what they're feeling and their emotions, maybe feeling shame. And if you say something simply like, that makes complete sense. It makes sense that you would want to self-harm. It makes sense to me. You're feeling so much pain. It totally makes sense that you would want to cut your arm. Or it totally makes sense that you're restricting food. It's a way of coping. You have a lot going on in your life. It just completely makes sense. So being able to validate those behaviors and things can be hugely helpful. So we validate to slow down negative reactivity, takes the focus off who is right, reduces arousal, and maintains fairness and decreases anger and conflict. This is the golden validation for, for deflecting, de-escalating, regulating. This stuff is golden in relationships. To be able to learn this skill validation and learn it well, you, you really will do better at work, at home, in your relationships. It, you, People will listen and want to spend time with you because you're making them feel good. I have a friend who I spend time with. I love taking her with me. I love taking her with me because she makes me feel so good. She'd be like, oh, did you know that Julie's ba 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 ba? Oh, did you know that, you know, this is amazing? Do you know? And she's always like validating so many things and I just want to take her everywhere. So you want to be that person, right? That people want to grab and take you everywhere because you are so validating and, and wonderful for, for others making them feel good. So validate, into me you see intimacy. It builds alliance, helps others trust, and gives a sense of being seen and understood, which is, and I'm sure many of you, I usually show the video Brenny Brown at this point, which is, um, uh, what is it called? Yeah. Bro, uh, empathy versus sympathy. That's mm -hmm. a really good video about being <coughs> in one with, and how you need to bring someone in one with before you can offer a change, right? Mm -hmm. We need to validate before change. Because if we jump in and suggest that we think someone should do this or give advice, right, then we, we, we just b basically negate any listening on the other end, right? They're not going to listen. You don't understand me. How could you let me know what you think I need to do when you can't even validate my feelings? You don't understand me. And that's another thing. I understand is invalidating. I completely understand is actually an invalidating thing to say to somebody because there's no way that any one of us could completely understand another person what their history, background, mental health challenges are. And it makes sense that if we were to jump into their body with their history, mental health challenges, experiences, we would feel the same way. Makes sense, right? Not agreeing doesn't mean you agree, doesn't mean making something valid. Don't validate the invalid. So this is an interesting one. So if someone comes to you and says, I'm such a loser, I'm so stupid, and you say, that makes sense, right? <laughs> that wouldn't be very validating. That's validating the invalid. So we can validate though the feelings behind that, right? We could say, oh, oh my goodness, that must feel so terrible to have those feelings. I would feel terrible if I felt like I was a loser and stupid, right? It's validating the feelings behind the, the, the statements. Right? So making sure not to invalidate the, the, validate the invalid. So self-validation is huge. How many people have, have done any work with Kristen Neff? Read a book? So I'm trying to take, I've tried several times, I'm going to finish it one day, the, uh, the self, Mindful Self-Compassion course. And one of my colleagues has taken it. And she's really put a lot of mindful self-compassion in through our course because I think it's something that Marsha was missing. And apparently I understand she was missing it because I went to a workshop not that long ago uh, and was trained on DBT for PTSD, which I was very excited about. It's a whole protocol by someone who's in Germany, a uh, psychologist, um, but which was really interesting. So he talks about how Marsha Linehan worked with a Buddhist that didn't, wasn't a particular kind that had compassion. So she's now added more compassion in through her work. Um, but I think it, it really needs sort of more Kristen Neff in there uh, to really build up, you know, of having self-validation and compassion. So notice in observing yourself without judgment, describe and reflect back and validate. Because what happens is we're in a very invalidating environment. People are invalidating us all the time. And we can't really change that. We can help model. We can maybe make suggestions. But what we need to do at the end of the day is self-validate because we're not always gonna get what we need from others, so we need to learn how to soothe ourselves with self-validation. So at the same time you're speaking with a student who maybe is, 
you know, I hate this, I, I'm getting bad marks, I'm so stupid, I can't stand it, my friends are terrible, right? Then validating that, being able to validate that, ra validate the feelings behind that is, is, uh, is huge. So this is a really great video, really great for kids. It's all about this monster from behind, this self-criticism monster that sort of is saying all these things and then a little white owl comes in and talks about how it makes sense that, that he's, th this little owl is feeling so bad when he's got this big monster behind him. Remember the time when Joy couldn't find her cell phone? Uh, you knew where it was, you filthy thief! Nobody likes you. Your friends don't even want to hang out with you. Joy only feels sorry for you. You're fat and ugly and disgusting. Look at yourself. You're not like everyone else. You're rotten. You never do anything right. You must try harder, otherwise you're a nobody. Worthless! 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 struggling and that you're disappointed with yourself but I'm here to help you you're not alone no wonder you're feeling bad with him hanging over you the critical part of ourselves can be so unkind when things go wrong don't listen to her <laughs> you know you're just weak don't talk to my friend like that It's so painful to be sad. Yeah. What he says makes me feel small. And so alone. Then tell him. You make me feel lonely and ashamed of who I am. It hurts too much. <laughs> he can't stand the light. I think it helps if we can see him. Leave me alone. Stop tormenting me. <laughs> Hey, I'm angry at you for always putting me down. Yes, and what do you need to feel better? I need you to stop bullying me like this. I need you to support me. I didn't mean it like that. I, I was only trying to protect you, to make sure you don't make a fool out of yourself. I didn't mean to torment or hurt you. I'm just trying to keep you on your toes so you don't fail. But it's not helpful. I need for you to tell me when I actually do something bad or really need to pull myself together. Not to criticize everything all the time. Look, I understand that you get very anxious and worried when Alfred makes mistakes. We can help you too, so you don't have to be so mean. Are you coming or what? Feeling down. 
approach your vulnerable emotions rather than avoiding them. Invite a person with whom you feel safe into your dark place and show your vulnerability. Ask your painful feelings what they need to feel better. Tell yourself that you deserve to have those needs met. Self-assertive anger and self-compassion are antidotes to the shame caused by our harsh inner critic. Remember, acknowledging vulnerability is showing strength. So step one for validation is actively observing and listening. So actively observe someone or yourself, put your stuff on the back burner, describe to yourself what you notice. I'm noticing that the person is frowning, crying, um, telling me what happened in their day, expressing anger. And then a difference between is and seems to be, noticing assumptions um, and helping others name their feelings can also be super helpful. Step two, reflecting back. So reflecting back, so basically, you know, what I'm hearing, what I imagine, I'm listening, checking whether your observation is correct. And then this is the best part, the, that makes sense. Or I notice that y you might be feeling angry. Does that fit for you? So one thing I learned about validation, I was one time in my car with a friend and she was getting super angry. And so I was trying out my new validation skills and I said to her, it, 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 it looks like you're really angry. And she said to me, how dare you put feelings into my mind? And I was like, oh my goodness, that didn't work, right? So being careful not to put feelings on others. So it's like, it, it, it seems to me that you might be angry. I'm wondering if that fits for you. Or I'm noticing that your face is really red and you're, you're, you're maybe the facts, right? Your hands are clenched and I'm just wondering how you're feeling right now. So making sure not to say, to say to someone how they feel. Helping them name their feelings doesn't mean telling them what they feel. So here's some examples. Here's what I'm hearing you say. I'm guessing that must have been hard for you. It makes complete sense that you would feel that way. Wow, that must have brought up a lot of anger. I can see this is important to you. That really sucks. I'm imagining you're feeling X right now. Does that fit? Based on what you're going through, I completely get that. Here's the validation don'ts, and then I would love for you to jump into your exercise. What you really should do is, no offense, but, oh, you worry too much. It's not that bad. You're way too sensitive. You get the idea. These are don'ts. We don't want to say these things. So turn to your neighbor. You have, I'll have an example or two. There's some overlap. And I'd really love for you to validate each other based on that scenario. And we're just going to take a couple minutes here. Everyone's feeling super validated now, right? We're all going to walk away from here feeling great, feeling validated. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. So if we could just do one example, if someone wants to let us know how they validated their particular scenario, read the scenario first and then let us know how you validated. The scenario. I'm trying to get a hold of this parent because I need their consent to get the mental health addiction nurse involved and the parent will not return my phone calls. How can I be validated in this situation? Frustration. You are running around making all the effort for that child and you don't have the support of the parent on the other side. That's perfect, right? It's like that makes sense that you'd feel and I love that you went into the details, right? Because then she really feels understood. This is what I'm hearing you say. This is challenging, this is frustrating that this parent isn't, you know. So getting into the details, the more we can mirror. So remember we're doing the observe, reflecting back, which was excellent, she did the reflecting back and then the validating, that must be frustrating. So that was excellent. The scenario, I feel like you are judging me. How can I be validated in this situation? Ah, okay, what do we do for that one? <laughs> so in terms of, uh, you, feel, you feel judged? You feel, I would say, uh, I noticed something over here, I'm sorry you feel that way, that would be invalidating. I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, because that says, I don't really care, uh, sorry you feel that way, right? <laughs> it's not, I don't feel that way, right? I don't feel that way, you shouldn't feel that way, why do you feel that way, right? Sorry, it was a good example, I had to run with it. I am so sorry that something I may have said or done has contributed to you thinking that way. I'm wondering if we can talk about it, because I would like to change that if I can. I don't want you to feel judged. That's amazing, and this is so great because this is the and piece, right? It's validate and change, right? So this is the change piece. I'm so sorry you feel that way. 
I don't, I don't want you to feel that way. That's the change piece. It's helping to change how the other person feels about what they're feeling, right? So that is like amazing change piece. So the first piece is the, the, no, the validating piece, right? This piece would be perfect. It, it, and having in front of it would be, oh, oh my goodness, that really sucks that you feel judged. That's it, that's validating. And exactly what Nancy said, because she had the change piece down, right? Validate first change next or no change a client who's used to being invalidated constantly by parents and colleagues or uh, other kids um, they just need to be validated for a while no change piece just let them be validated just the tone in her voice was enough too yeah to make that validating, yes and tone is so important right mm -hmm. it has to be genuine right which is really hard sometimes but tone, all of those things, body language, tone. You know, you could say something super validating, but then, you know, be standing like this, right? Or, or just, or, 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 or rocking around while you're saying and not even looking at the person, right? Or maybe you're on your cell phone, that's a good one, right? <laughs> I'm sorry you feel that way, right? Or, or I, I just, I'm, you know, I, yeah, that really sucks, right? We do this, I've seen people do this. The cell phone is killing us. It's so invalidating, right? So making sure tone, and now you got the idea of what, the, what can be an and piece and what the validating. The validating is just saying I understand without saying I understand exactly because we've already determined that's not validating. But essentially that's what you're doing. You're, you're putting yourself in one with and telling them it makes sense that they feel is normal. This is a normal response. I don't like using that word. But for them, it's normal for them, right? It may not be for us. It may, it may be like... This doesn't make sense at all to me. Why would this person do this, right? It makes sense to them. So we need to validate them. Again, it doesn't mean you agree, endorse, like, you can hate it, disagree with it, but you can always validate something. There's always something to validate. It's the feelings behind it are always there to validate. So that is the validation. I wanted to tell you, this is my passion, my passion. I'm hoping some of you will help me with my passion. So I've been making a documentary. It's called Life on DBT. And I've brought in a lot of people who were willing to come forward. I was so amazed because I have a lot of contacts and I've been building them up for a lot of years to put it out there and say, who wants to come forward and talk about how life was before and after DBT? So I have a lot of footage, thanks to Yvonne, because Yvonne has been helping me with this project as well. It was a little more difficult a project than this one. Yes. <laughs> so, um, I'm hoping to actually raise some funds to try and really make this thing grand. But this is, these are some, pe some pieces. I have a lot of footage, but these are just some pieces that I pulled just to show you. I didn't cope with things the same way. I was more sensitive. Uh, I didn't self-soothe the way others did. I would get exceptionally upset about things and I wouldn't calm down the way most people would. Going to sleep at night was hard. I had the most terrible nightmares. Waking up was hard because I had multiple panic attacks in a day. It's like a roller coaster, a lot of ups, downs, but it's weird because like on the good times it's like I'm euphoric. And the bad times, it's just like someone just like ripped everything out of me. And I'm just like this void, like this empty shell. I used to pull my hair a lot of times to go under the walk and hit myself in the, in the head. And I didn't know why. Hearing them come back week after week, talking about the improvements in their life or how they're using the skills and the success they are having with them, even the challenges that they may be having with them, just the fact that they're out there practicing the skills, it makes me feel so great because I know what that's like and I'm so proud of them. One thing I've learned from DPD especially is mindfulness and radical acceptance. It is what it is and you can't change um, what's happened, you can't change the future. Um, what you can change is how you yourself respond to things. Um, it's about re responding, not reacting, and that's a big difference that DBT made in my life. Uh, my favorite skill is uh, validation because 
I find the world sometimes uh, makes you feel that you're not adequate. Don't catastrophize. And that's something that I have taken quite to heart. You know, I will wake up in the morning tomorrow. I will go to work tomorrow. And I can't worry about what might be. Finding dialectical living, that was one of the, well, for me, it's what actually set my life onto the proper trajectory. Because like I said, like I didn't know any of this stuff. The waiting times to get into this kind of stuff is months. And I didn't have months, I need now. So when I find dialectical living, it was like, okay, cool, I got into the next course, which wasn't too long waiting time. And that's what helped me get to where I am now. With DBT, I learned the, the things that I like. I discovered the, myself again. I discovered the activities that I like. My relationship with my girlfriend at this time is uh, almost like 99% better because of the skills and tools I have learned at uh, DBT. From my being before DBT and after DBT, it's being going to hell and back. Marsha Linehan, who developed dialectical behavior therapy, talks about having a life worth living. And all of these skills can help have a life worth living. You are not alone. DDT works. My passion. Thank you. So, I had one last slide. And we're just at, at noon. So essentially, I tried to weave this in as we went because I wasn't sure with all the content that we'd get at least to the place where this, it's uh, how can we bring this into our practice. So I wonder if, if there's maybe just two, if we could just do two ideas uh, uh, that you may have had. And I've tried to sort of, as I mentioned, say, okay, this is how you could do it with students or clients. Has, has anyone got any pressing like, oh, my God, I know I can bring this into my practice. Now I know how. I've got some ideas. Anyone? A little bit? You don't have to say anything, I'm just asking. Hands up. Yeah, that you have way, that you think you have ways after we've talked about this that you could bring this and maybe you have an ice pack that you go and get for a student who's, who's you know, in, in a place of escalation. You know, maybe now you know how to validate and de-escalate your colleagues and your, your clients and students, right? Now maybe you know for yourself how you can soothe yourself, how you can use dear <coughs> statements at home with your partner. Brilliant, there's where to start. Because oftentimes, you know, our relationships need a lot of that, right? Validation and dear. Best two things you got in your back pocket for your personal relationships and of course with your clients as well. So I'm hoping that all of you, not only are thinking of ways to use this with clients, but also all kinds of ways that you're inspired to go home, make a distress tolerance box for yourself. Maybe you have kids, help them. It's a great activity to make distress tolerance box for your kids. So I hope that you're walking away with some new ideas, maybe, and also different ways of teaching. And I'm really excited to provide the PDF so you can see more of the videos and have access to those and things. So I'll definitely do that through Nancy. So thank you so much, everyone, for having me. As I said, there was nowhere else that I would have rather been this morning. And I'm just so excited that you had me here today. Thank you. So Judy, oh. on behalf of all of us, I think I can safely say there's nowhere else that we would have rather been uh, this morning. It's really challenging to pitch a presentation to a diverse kind of range of experience and you did a phenomenal job to do that. I know I've got a few more tools in my toolkit and I think having links to those videos will be very helpful. And I want to thank you for all the time and effort that you put in to customize the presentation for us. That a lot of times we get presentations and they're not as exquisitely tailored and so they don't land. They don't, you know, kind of uh, help us to make those connections between what we're learning and the work that we do or how we might also benefit um, from what we're learning in our personal lives. And you did that uh, so exquisitely. So um, thank you for uh, introducing uh, some of us to DBT. Thank you, hopefully, for wetting uh, all of our appetites to learn more. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have one other thing to show you, my other passion, because I'm sure you'd like to know about this coloring book. So I'm actually creating a DBT coloring book. 
And so this would be great for yourselves as well as your, as well as your students. So I'm really hoping, this one isn't published yet, but I am working away on it. This one is a skills reminder booklet that, uh, that can be carried around with all the acronyms in it. So to help you remember, it has every acronym that we've been talking about, what it means, and a little bit about how to practice it. So I also have some other passions, and I'm hoping these coloring books will be really helpful for kids, right, to help them learn the skills. And they're actually animals. We've actually sat in focus groups, and we decided each skill had an animal related to it. So radical acceptance is a unicorn, a deer is some cats, accept is, is the tentacles of an octopus, so we call them dialectimals. So we have dialectimals in the coloring book. Every skill is related to an animal. So very excited, another passion. Thank you, that's it. <laughs>